All right, folks. Um, let's begin our service with, with uh, singing hymn number 262. All right, do you have your hymn books there? 262, Power in the Blood. Okay, 262. Sing it all through. Since Jesus came into 
point number 454. 454. I'd rather have Jesus. 454. How many verses do we have here? Three. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs>
and it starts to cross that path where you go from trusting God and you're thinking about things to you're trusting yourselves and you're trying to work things out and that worry overtakes in your life. So Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to read verses 25 to 34. And the Bible says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, for what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are they are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why they take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So, as I mentioned, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And really this passage is speaking about true investing. Seeking the kingdom, investing in God's kingdom. And if you study the gospel, we know that there's four different authors to the gospel. And every author of those gospel portrays God or portrays Christ in a different light. So in the book of Matthew and the gospel of Matthew, we see that uh, Jesus Christ is portrayed as king. And we need to invest in his kingdom. Jesus Christ is our king and he can be king of our life and he can be in control of our life. But we always struggle to fully give him control sometimes and when you think about the fact that jesus christ is our heavenly father he's the king of our life and you, you you know you think about sometimes you know what would it be like if i was born into a different family and maybe you see someone um online or something like that or you picture you know i often uh, picture when i see um uh, images of Prince Harry and his little kids, you know, and you know, they're normal little kids, you see them acting up, doing things, but they have privilege, they have special things that are handed to them because they are royalty, because they're part of the royal family. But then you think about us, and as believers, and Jesus Christ is the king of our lives, and we worry about so many things, but yet still, we have so many benefits because we're the child of a king, but we forget about those things. We forget to look on those things. You know, we can enjoy his benefits, but we're too busy worrying about things we ought not to be worrying about. We should be serving him, but we're too busy worrying. We're busy losing sleep over things that God says not to worry about. Losing sleep over things that we're thinking about dwelling on. And I'm not talking about natural causes, you know, the older you get, you stay up for other things, you know, heartburn, <laughs> maybe a headache, aches and pains, but some of us are losing sleep because we're so worried, we're stressed, we're full of anxiety over things that we can't see the end to, and that really bothers us, things we can't control, and you, you're trying to fix things so you can stop worrying, but it never comes to that point. Or we say, well, stop worrying when God answers that prayer. Well, the truth is, if we're praying, we're putting our trust in God, then we don't, don't need to worry because we can trust in whatever his answer may be. You know, our contentment in life doesn't depend upon the different circumstances in our lives. You know, there's so many things that change in our lives, so many variables that are always 
changing. You know, maybe it's at work, you're trying to get a promotion, you're trying to get into a different area, or you're trying to, you know, whatever it is at work. Or maybe it's about finances, or maybe it's issues at home, or it's things that need to be fixed at home, or the car is breaking down, or you got bad news from the doctor, or maybe it's a relationship. But the truth is, it doesn't matter what any of those things are, nothing changes the fact that God is still on the throne, that he's still the king of our lives, and that he is still good. In these verses, uh, or sorry, the verse uh, before we started reading, verse 24, it says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot, or you cannot serve God and mammon. So we see here that struggle between who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve Jesus Christ your king? Or are you going to serve money? Are you going to serve things in your lives? You're either going to serve God or you're going to serve money or the system of money. You're either going to serve God or you're going to serve things. You're either going to serve God or you're going to serve people. You're either going to have faith or you're going to work. You see what I'm saying there? there, there's, there it's different. You can't serve God and man. You can't have faith and worry. you got to put off the worry and put your faith in God. You know, we can so easily become slaves to things in our lives. We can become slaves to money. We can be slaves to worry, where we're completely consumed by worry, and it enslaves us and entraps us. So we can be slaves to money, or we can be servant to God. I mentioned it this morning, you know, the world looks at uh, believers and say, well, you're in bondage to God. You know, you're so tied down by your religion. But the truth is, we have freedom in Christ. And we see this throughout the scripture. John 8.32, it says, And the truth shall make you free. Romans 6.18, Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Romans 6.22, Now being made free from sin. Romans 8.2, Christ Jesus hath made us free from the law of sin and death. And Galatians 5.1, I read this, this, uh, that this morning. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Listen, we need freedom from the things that we worry about in our lives. We need freedom from worry. We need freedom from anxiety and stress. And we find that in Jesus Christ. You know, we don't need any more self-help books or you know, TV programs where they talk about all the solutions, or you don't need a new outlook on life, we need Jesus Christ. Circumstances will change, but God will always be on the throne. God's word will always be true, and God will always be good. So there's a couple things I want you to notice this morning in the passage that we read. Um, but the first thing I want you to notice is we need to behold or consider. And we see that in verse 26 and verse number 28. The Bible says in verse 26, Behold the fowls of the air. And verse 28 says, Consider the lilies of the field. We need to behold and consider God's creation this morning. When we read these verses, we see that God takes care of nature. He takes care of the birds. We even read that in the passage that we read this morning in uh, Psalm 147. We see that he takes care of the birds. He takes care of the flowers. He takes care of the fields. And he's saying, my creation is in order. You know, God's creation doesn't stand still when we start worrying. You know, time doesn't stand still. Things keep moving. And you know what? God is always in control. So God created everything and his creation is in order. When you look, when you really take time to consider nature, you really take time to consider God's creation, it's an absolutely amazing thing. So think about the earth. You know, the last few days we've been driving a lot and we've been looking at the moon. The moon's been really big the last few days and there's, there was a super moon, things like that. And it kind of puts in the perspective the, the universe that God created. But think about this. 
the earth is in the perfect position. It's in the perfect position from the perfect size sun. Water needs to be liquid, not too cold that it's frozen, or too hot that it evaporates. The right amount of light for plants to grow, the right amount of radiation that's safe for life. The perfect position to be protected by our atmosphere and to contain oxygen. The perfect size moon, its gravity drives the ocean's tides, keeps the Earth's perfect tilted axis, which provides perfect gentle seasons and perfect timing, which we see in Psalm 104, 19. He appointed the moon for seasons, the sun knoweth is going down. The perfect amount of hours, the perfect day, the perfect night, the perfect amount of land and of water. The perfect amount of rotation to keep the earth heated and cooled properly. The perfect spot in the galaxy as to not be constantly hit with debris. And scientists have said if you were to take all this, all these probabilities of all these components, the likelihood of a planet having all of these features is one thousandth of a trillion. God is in control. That didn't happen by chance. There's no, there is no accident of us being here. God created us and placed us on this earth. He numbered the stars and named them all. In 1995, scientists picked out a little section of the sky that was devoid of stars. To the naked eye, and even in the normal telescope, the region looked empty and black. The section was tiny. It covered the same amount of sky that a tennis ball would cover if it were 100 meters above it. The scientists used the Hubble telescope to take a 10 day long exposure of the region to find out what was in the blackness. In the image, the faintest little dot is an entire galaxy. There are over 10,000 in the image, each one containing about around 100 billion stars. Scientists used the info from this photo to estimate that the, uh, the observable, observable universe contains over 100 billion galaxies, which puts the total stars in the observable universe around 100 sextillion stars. I don't even know how many zeros that would be. <laughs> to put that in perspective, the University of Hawaii calculated an estimate for the number of grains of sand in the world at 7.5 quintillion. That means for every grain of sand on Earth, there are about 10,000 stars in the universe. And that is from a worldly human understanding from what we can calculate. And yet still, Psalm 147 says that God numbers and names every star. That's how big our God is. And that's how much he is in control, not only of the universe and what we see, but us as well. We are wonderfully, wonderfully made. We see that in Psalm 139. We see that in Jeremiah 1.5, that we are formed in the belly. God knew us. And God still thinks about us. And he takes care of us. But in this world that we live in, when we're consumed with worry, we're consumed with stress and fear, we can be surrounded by people everywhere in our lives and yet still feel so lonely and feel so hopeless. But then you look at a passage like Matthew 6 and you see that, you know what? God even cares about the birds. He cares about the flowers. He cares about the field and takes care of all the little details. How much better are we, is what he says, than those things. Psalm 37 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he should not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. Listen, no matter how lonely you feel, no matter how much worry you have in your life, how much stress, anxiety there is, we are somebody. 
We have a purpose, and we're not an accident of evolution here by chance, but God has placed us here for a purpose. He is the king of our lives, and we can trust him and put our faith in him and not worry because he has taken care of the details. So we consider his creation. We consider his salvation. You know, we talked about a lot about that this morning, about God's salvation for us. Psalm 56, 13, For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Will not thou deliver my feet from falling? David here is speaking of his deliverance from enemies. God saved us. Can he not keep our feet from falling? You know, God sent his son to die on the cross for us to give us salvation. Can we not trust him for the everyday needs of our lives? We trust God with our salvation. Why can we not trust him with the issues of our life? John 10, verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. It says, bear witness of me in, in the first verse. Look at God's creation all around us. Look at God's work in your life already. It says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. God takes care of his own. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Listen, we are so secure in our salvation with Christ, yet we become so insecure with the worries of life. Listen, we need to allow God to rule our lives again. We need to be free from the bondage of stress and worry. So we consider and we, be, we behold, but as well we need to be content. In verse 27 it says, Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? One cubit, that's about 18 inches. Or the measurement is base, uh, the base of the elbow to the tip of the middle finger. So from there to there is about a cubit. He's saying who can add height by thinking about it? You know, we are the way that God made us. We're wonderfully, fully made. You know, my height, God wonderfully made me this height. I can think about my stature all I want, but nothing is going to change. And I need to be confident and uh, fine with that. Be content with how God wonderfully made me. And we laugh because it's, you know, it's, it's good to laugh, be able to laugh at ourselves. But yet still, we have so many insecurities in our life about ourselves and our, our physical beings, but this is the way God made us for a purpose and for his glory and for his honor. You know, much of our worrying is because we're not happy with what God's given to us or content with what God's given to us. You know, clothes, maybe food, the family, the car, the job that we have. Listen, don't forget God's blessing in our lives. God sent manna from heaven to feed his people. We talked about the Israelites this morning as they left Egypt. But as God continued to lead them, he, he provided them with manna. And you know what happened? They got used to the blessings that they started to complain about God's providence. They complained about his blessings. And they spoke about how they freely ate in Egypt. They said, remember all the garlic and the leeks and the fresh food that we used to have? They were reminiscing about being in bondage again because they forgot about the blessings that God had given to them. And if we're not careful, we will ignore the blessings of God and we will complain about what God has given to us and we'll start working, looking back at the world and saying, you know what, maybe it was better before I came to God. Maybe it was better when I was trying to do things myself. Maybe it was better when I took care of my own needs. Listen, we, we have daily miracles and blessings that we take for granted. And we get used to the God's divine providence. Psalm 103, verse 2, the Bible says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. 
who forgiveth all thine iniquities, he forgives me. Who healeth all thy diseases, he heals me. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, he freed me. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, he crowns me. Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, he satisfies me with what's best. so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. This mere soul blessed. But yet still sometimes we lose our sense of wonder with what God has done for us and given to us. I've used this illustration before, but I think about it. In 1989, Russian president visited a grocery store in amazement. When he saw how freely the people can walk into a grocery store, pick up the food they need, cash out, and leave, he was amazed. This is the president. He said, if our people saw this, there would be a revolution if they knew how freely people can <coughs> We're blessed. We can go outside and get in our car and walk wherever we want. We can go to the store and buy the food that we need. We get to see our friends, we get to come to church, we have Bibles, we have all the things that we need. We need to be content with where God has you, with what he's given to us, where he's putting you, or what he's putting you through. Our life is what it is now because God knows best. It's just like the, the children of Israel this morning as they are free from Egypt and they cross the Red Sea and they're so happy and God leads them right to bitter water and they become discontent. But that's where God led them for a purpose. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Part of overcoming, overcoming worry is being content. Now, I'm not going to stress over the things that God has ordained in my life. I'm not going to worry over the things that I don't have, but rather glory in what God has blessed me with. Psalm 68, verse 19, Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth me with benefits, even the God of our salvation. Be content. We need to seek God as well. We see that in verse 33. He talks about all the things that he takes care of, how we don't need to think about them, but he says, but seek ye first. We need to seek God. Do you want peace? Put God first in your life. Seek me and all these things that I spoke about, all the things that I take care of, all the benefits, all these things shall be added unto you. Verse 32, it says, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, all the needs that they worry about. Or, in other words, the, the world to pursue these things. They expend their time, they expend their energy. You know, it's all about they, what they want, their agenda, their pleasure. Putting their job first, getting wealth first, concerned about getting their food and what to wear and the things they want, and they're afraid to lose things. Listen, as believers, what are we chasing today? Verse 21 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Listen, when God is our passion, when God is our pursuit, when He is our priority, He will give us our provision. And you get all that you need. You'll get all you want because when you pursue God, when He's your priority, He gives you what you want because He gives you what to want. He makes you content. Amen. It's just like when the Bible tells us that God will give us the desires of our heart. That's because when we're trusting God and putting Him first in our lives, He will tell us the desires of our heart. He will change and He will make us content in Him. So seek first the kingdom of God. We need to be investing in eternity. You know, the Bible tells us as believers we are ambassadors for Christ. We are servants. We see that in Romans 6.22, being now made free from sin and become servants of God. 
Colossians 3, verses 1 to 3, we should be investing in eternity. We need to be giving to God. We need to be putting God first in all things. So we need to seek Him and not be seeking the things of the world. You know, it's so easy for us to pursue things in life that aren't investing in eternity. You know, are you pursuing that promotion? Are you pursuing more money? Are you pursuing that dream house? Are you pursuing that dream car? And here's the thing, these things aren't wrong in and of themselves. You know, God blesses you with that dream house. He dresses, blesses you with that dream car. He blesses you with that promotion. That is great. But those things, if they take priority in our lives, when that is the sole pursuit of our lives, when they take priority over God, that is when they become wrong. We need to be in pursuit of God and His will. We need the thirst for God. Psalm 41, it says, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? It's talking here about the, the doe, the deer that goes and seeks after water. They thirst for it more than hunger. You know, we, you see in the wild, there's herds of animals, nomadic animals, where all they do is they pursue water. There's nomadic tribes that all they do is pursue water. You look at the world today, what is the world pursuing after? Not the things of God, but we as believers, we need to be pursuing the things of God. We need to be thirsting for the word of God. We need the hunger for the word of God. Job talks about how he hungers for the word of God. He said, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. With all that Job had gone through, he lost everything. He says, I'm not going to depart from the word of God. I'm going to keep doing right. I will keep seeking him. And the truth is that's so opposite of Christians today. What do you see happen a lot of times when things don't go right for believers? I've seen it too often where they turn their back on God. They don't remain faithful to him because it isn't what, isn't what they expected. We need to hunger after the word of God. We need to seek Him, thirst for His Word, hunger for His Word. We need to pray for great things. Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things, which shall thou knowest not. Listen, when we're worrying about things, we're not going to be calling on God, asking for great things. We're not going to be placing our faith in Him. We need to be going to God in prayer. Cast in your care upon him, for he careth for you. We need to seek him today. Verse 34 says, Think, think therefore no thought for tomorrow, for the morrow, for tomorrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. <coughs> so not only do we need to seek God, but I'm not talking about in the future. You know, don't go home and seek God tomorrow or tonight. Seek God now. It talks about today. Seek Him today. Serve God today. We can't be the Christian God wants us to be today if we're worrying about tomorrow. We need to determine, I'm going to serve Jesus now. I'm going to give now. I'm going to sacrifice now. I'm going to seek now. I'm going to trust Him now. I'm going to witness now. I'm going to study now. I'm going to encourage now. I'm going to pray now. Listen, we are becoming what, what, or you are becoming what you will be today, based upon what you're going to do today. You know, how many, how many of us have aspirations where you're like, yeah, we well, you know what, one day I'm going to do this great thing. 
One day I'm going to go on this great trip. One day I'm going to go on this great expedition. One day I'm going to have this. But we can keep talking about one day, but if you don't do something about it today, it's never, never going to happen. The same is true with serving God. You might say, well, one day I'm going to serve God. One day I'm going to witness for Him. One day I'm going to give that sin back to Him. But one day will never come if you don't do something about it today. Just take no thought of the morrow. Reject anxiety for the future. You know, nothing you worry about is going to change a thing for tomorrow. This rests in the fact that God is control in control. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Listen, don't let the worries of tomorrow stop you from serving today or seeking today. We as a church, as a body of believers, we need to be believers. We need to be brothers and sisters of Christ. We're going to be all in. We're going to be 100%. Stepping out of where we're comfortable and serving the Lord. So don't be spent on worrying about tomorrow that you have nothing to spend on God today. You give so much of yourself to other things that you don't have anything to give to God. We don't need to worry. <laughs> Worrying is draining. It's so draining and yet still you stay up because you can't sleep. You know, how does that work? <laughs> You're exhausted from worrying and you can't sleep. That doesn't make for a good next day, does it? But listen, God wants to give you peace. And he wants you to have rest. Psalm 4 verse 8 says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. You don't need to worry. But not worrying doesn't mean to do nothing either. We still have to do things. We still have to work. We still have to go to school. We still have to be a witness. We still have to work for the Lord. But it's about where our heart is, where our priority is. Proverbs 6, verse 6 says, Go to the ant, thou slugger, consider her ways, and be wise. So consider today, what should you be doing in our lives? We know we shouldn't be worrying. We need to be putting our faith in God, but what does God want you doing today? How are you seeking God today? How are you investing in his eternity today? Maybe you're here and you're not saved. You're not part of the kingdom. You need to be saved. Maybe you don't know what the plan for your life is, but you're not here by an accident. Your life has a purpose and God has a plan for you. But if anything, if you get nothing else out of this, we need to focus on today. We don't need to worry about tomorrow. We don't need to worry about the needs of tomorrow. We don't need to worry about what we're going to do or how we're going to do great things tomorrow unless we're starting to do them today. So we need to seek God. Are you seeking Him? Are you stagnant? Are you panting after Him and His Word? Are you thirsting and hungering after His Word? Are you calling on him, or are you enslaved by worry? Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would give us all peace in our hearts, that you help us to prioritize you, that we wouldn't spend worry on other areas, but that we'd spend our energy and time on serving you and seeking you, making a difference in eternity. And Lord, I pray that you just help us to all trust in you, place our faith in you, and not be so cast to the side and downtrodden that we can't go through our day and get the job done that we need to and be a witness and a testimony that we need. But Lord, through it all in every situation, every area, that you use our lives as a, a testimony, a witness, uh, something that you can use to bring glory to your name and to point others to you. 
So Lord, I pray these things now in your son's precious name. Amen. So thank you once again for joining us today. I hope you've been challenged by the word of God. And uh, just a reminder, um, there'll be no devotion on Thursday. There'll be a Saturday devotion. And if you want to talk to the board about outreach, you can talk to them about that. And if you haven't already signed up for the health tournament, that is it. And continue to pray for pastors as you travel. So you are dismissed.